Thanks for tuning in to the Medevac podcast, powered by the Robert Irvine Foundation, whose mission is to support and strengthen the physical and mental well-being of our nation's heroes and their families. They provide them with life-changing opportunities, resources, and support through food, wellness, community, and financial support programs. I'm one of your hosts, David Reed. And I'm your other host, Christian Myers. Thank you very much for joining us today on the Medevac podcast. If you're new here, there's a price for the show. Keep in mind, if you get something out of today's episode, you have to share it with a friend or family member. Um, and you're going to get something out of today's episode, rest assured. Where can they find information about us? Oh, yes. Please head on over to medevacpodcast.com, and you can find more information on the show. You can watch all the episodes right there, as well as uh, get linked up with our partner organizations like the Robert Irvine Foundation and some of our sponsors like Black Rifle Coffee. Go give a look there, and you can uh, even donate direct to the Robert Irvine Foundation on that page. And the best way to interact with us is going to be on social media, Instagram at Medevac Podcast. You can reach myself and Dave there directly. Uh, let us know what kind of uh, guests you want to hear, topics you want to hear about, and uh, and the like. Excellent comments, questions. Yeah. We like hearing it all. Go hit one of the buttons underneath it and interact somehow, <laughs> please. Uh, our guest today is a uh, distinguished gentleman, Fred Padilla. He spent uh, 36 years in the military. He's a major general, re- retired now, mm-hmm. as of just a few years ago. That's right. And thank you very much for joining us today, Fred. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, happy to have you. U.S. Marines. Marines, Ooh, yeah. We haven't had a Marine on in quite a while, actually. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. It's been and and we definitely... Are the, we are the few. Yeah. <laughs> and the proud, <laughs> yeah. obviously. So, uh, yeah, and and a general nonetheless. So let's rewind it back a okay. couple of years and talk about, like, what inspired you to join the military in the beginning? Well, uh, yeah, so I was, uh, I grew up in a military family. It was mm-hmm. Air Force. My dad mm-hmm. was Air Force. And as it turns out, two of my brothers and two of my sisters all went in the Air Force. Mm-hmm. But I was the middle kid, so middle kid syndrome being what it is. It had to be a little bit different. So, uh, I, and, and also, I didn't like flying. And, and, uh, and my dad told me, if you don't like flying, don't go in the Air Force. <laughs> you know, and so I said, okay. And uh, I started looking at uh, some, I really I went to college when the Iranian hostage crisis was going on, and also the Soviet uh, Union attacked into Afghanistan, and mm-hmm. we had the oil embargo on the United States. It was it was a it, it was the, uh, what was then a low point mm. for 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 the United States. I th- I thought, and it was frustrating for me as a college student to see that. And whereas at the be- uh, well, when I first went into college, I was kind of not wanting to go in the military, not because I wasn't supportive of the military. I was very much so, but I wasn't sure I wanted to have that lifestyle because mm-hmm. we, moved, we moved around so much when mm-hmm. I was growing up. But when I was in college, I realized that if I didn't serve, I would regret it for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to go in for at least just my initial tour just to serve my country. And so 36 plus years later, I was still doing it. So that's incredible. There you go. Sounds like it slowly evolved. <laughs> it, 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 maybe I'm slow to learn or whatever it is. But no, I, it was, I, I tell you, it was, it, it was everything I had hoped it would be. Hmm. I, I, I got to serve with some of the greatest human beings on the planet and uh, got to do something that I th- thought was important. And yeah. I still think it was important to do. And, and, and you experienced the very best but also the very worst of what mankind has to offer. Mm, absolutely. And That's very true. So, uh, so it was, you know, if, if, I don't, if I accomplished nothing else in my lifetime, uh, it was a life well spent. Mm. That's incredible. So obviously with that amount of time in, you saw a just ample amount of changes that happened yeah. as far as training has gone, as far as the average recruits. What did the initial training look like in the beginning? Uh, it was a lot of Buddha, Buddha, bang, bang. You know? <laughs> what I mean by that was we had no money to train, so we're instead of firing actual rounds or even blank rounds at each other, or now you have you know you have uh, you know things you know the uh, the gear that will that will actually simulate uh, simulate being shot. Yeah, the and, simunitions. Yeah, you know, and yeah. the simunitions and all that kind of thing. Uh, much holographic uh, enhancements to yeah. to training uh, in close quarters and th- those kinds of things just didn't exist back then. It was, you know, we, we're with all the best intentions, we were out there doing training the, mm. the best we could yeah. with nothing. Uh, and we were you, still Vietnam era equipment. Mm. Sure. Our rifle was the Vietnam rifle. Our, our, our the, the uh, uniforms and gear that we carried yeah. was the same gear that was carried in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, it, you know, it hadn't been that long actually, but, you know, it, it, you know, Vietnam ended in 1974, 75, when, you know, when, when Saigon fell. And then, and then uh, so it was only you know, less than ten years later that I'm talking about when I when I came in and, and was a young 
young a Marine and undergoing this training and, and trying to be, you know, be innovative at the same yeah. time that you, know, you come to grips with the dismal fiscal situation. Mm. But, uh, but we made it work, uh, you know, but it's, it's so, I will say this about change though. It, change is occurring more rapidly because mm. we, we, we use that same gear for a long time since then. Uh, it, it, things change more rapidly every day. Almost. Yeah, it, it really is. I mean, you, know, it, it, you can you can attribute that to a lot. You know, information technology. Uh, you know, there's a lot. A lot of things are just and niche markets too. I feel that's like right, yeah. there's a lot of it, like chin straps, for instance. There's yeah. companies dedicated to making chin straps. Yeah. yeah, and you know that that was like 60, 70 well, years of the same one. Earplugs. Earplugs yeah. as well. I mean, I mean, I never, yeah, I never. There, there are a lot of ads out about, hey, if you serve between this time and this time, you can <laughs> yeah, put a f- three claim. millimeter, <laughs> yeah, three M earplugs. I, you know, I didn't walk around wearing earplugs uh, in combat. You know, when so when when the firing started, I didn't say, okay, time out. You know, let me yeah, put my like, earplugs in. Yeah. No, we just were exposed to the noise, and yeah. that's just just yeah. the way it is. So that's an interesting question that I'm prompted up next is. Do you see that more of a detriment, the reliance on technology within our military, or do you see this as a strength, or is there a balance that we could find our recruits finding in the middle? There is a balance that needs to be struck. I mean, obviously, we can't ignore technology and mm-hmm. what the advantages that it can give us. We have to develop those, and, and, and we have to capitalize on those and leverage those, those advantages to mm-hmm. the extent that we can. At the same time, though, we can't, we can't throw out the old, old ways of doing things. For mm-hmm. example... Um, when land navigation, yeah. not everybody's going to have a Garmin or a GPS or something like that to be able to land navigate. And that's going to be one of the first things that's taken out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If it's relying upon a satellite or anything like that, electromagnetic pulses and all these kinds of things, they're going to, they're going to have an impact and you still got to be able to dead reckon, dead reckon. You got to mm-hmm. pull out a compass, fall, be able to figure out what, what a, a, the azimuth is, applying the inclination of the map that you're looking at and all that, and then to be able to train associate. You know, see, mm. you know, looking at the contour lines and see yeah. what I'm, what I'm, all those kinds of old school things that, that we were taught way back in the olden times, it seems like, mm-hmm. uh, we still, those still have value. Uh, and being able to use iron sights on a weapon system, yeah. for example, I mean, we have optics, they're great, but are they always going to work? Are they not, are they, are they, are they completely uh, resistant to any kind of damage at all? No, they're not. And so you're going to have to be able to go old school at some point. Mm-hmm. And, and that means, you know, being able to, qualify with with iron sights it's just my personal opinion back to the basics back to the basics yeah that's what it comes down to most of the time is being very proficient at the basics is going to set you up for the longevity and then all those things enhancements just Mm -hmm. make you better exactly Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. if you can fall back onto that initial training easily Uh, you did say one thing about uh marines being resourceful and in my experience that is one thing that uh, i was always always keen on working with Marines because they are the most resourceful people I think I've ever met. <laughs> well, there's a reason why we're resourceful, because we're under-resourced. Yeah, you have to be, so, right? So, you, know, you know, with my Army brethren, you know, we, we were, my first tour was in Camp Lejeune, hmm. and uh, we, we used to go to Fort Bragg. We want to train at Fort Bragg because we would <laughs> yeah. go there, and, and the soldiers would switch gear with us. Because they could survey their gear and get brand new gear, mm. we we uh, couldn't do we okay. couldn't get it. So they knew that. So we would we would go there and train with them. They'd give they'd give us their gear. We'd give them the, our crappy gear, and then they'd go and survey and get new gear, and then we'd go back oh, with, there with go. new gear. Why is this just a reoccurring issue? I mean, this has been an issue with the Marines for a long time. If you're first to fight, yeah, you should have. A great access to gear, yeah. especially more than the Air Force. Come on. Yeah, I was in the Air Force. I, we didn't do half the things you guys yeah. did, but trust me, we had some Gucci gear. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I, I think it, part of it is part of it it, it. it it makes us. It's actually there's some benefit to it. Yeah, and they because take pride. it makes us be resourceful. Yeah. It makes us be more mindful of what we're you know what we're taking care of our gear. I mean, yeah. no one no one takes care of their gear. I don't think better than. Yeah, better than the Marine Corps does. You are correct. It's because we just yeah. don't have we don't have the luxury of yeah. just replacing things uh, all the time. Uh, and I will say that you know, in terms of resourcing, we it's gotten better over the years. Mm-hmm. I think, mm-hmm. but uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it teaches good habits. Yes, if nothing yep. else. Yeah, I think it's they, they take a sense of pride yeah. in that uh, in that as well. Yeah. Being being under resourced and overutilized, yeah. you know, there, there's a sense of pride with that, yeah. right? Yeah, that makes sense. So let's talk about the focal point of training and how that was initially in the later 80s uh, as, you, as you push through Desert Storm, as you see 9-11 happen. Yeah. How did that training change over time? 
besides technology? Because that has a huge impact. Well, it's it's really interesting and probably not a surprise to anybody that served, both of you. I mean, I, I, it's probably no surprise to you either. But um, when, we, when we're involved in a real-world contingency, the, in, the industrial complex g- gets energized. Hmm. And so things start to get developed very quickly. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I, 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 there was not a whole lot going on up until Desert Storm. I mm-hmm. mean, we had Grenada and we had Beirut, and, but that really didn't change too much. And it, it was a, Grenada, uh, Grenada was a joint operation. And I say that in quotes because we, we, what we demonstrated was that we weren't joint at all, mm-hmm. none of us. Yeah. And, and, and so there was some, there was some, th- uh, some uh, consequences that came out of that that forced us to be more joint. Uh, Goldwater, Nickel, Gold, Goldwater Nichols Act, for example. I mean, it made us be more joint made us, you know, we have to explain why we had different gear than, than the Marine Corps had different gear than the Army, for yeah. example. Uh, and in some cases, mm-hmm. there are good reasons, but in some cases, there weren't good reasons. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and it's, it's obviously, you gain efficiencies in, in, in when, you, when you can use the same gear, if you mm-hmm. can. I mean, because you're buying, bigger buy mm-hmm. drives down the unit cost yes. kind of thing. But, uh, but so... Um, there wasn't a whole lot going on, really, though, in terms of major, major real-world contingencies until Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Then everything seemed to be like put on fast forward, mm. and we started developing things very quickly. Yeah, and, and that and that continued. And we did Somalia. At, you know, Somalia was after that, and and that kind of kept things going mm. along. You know, so different vehicles, you know, different weapon systems, more enhanced, you know, went, optics. went from very woodland style <laughs> training yes. environments to now you're seeing urban situations, yeah. urban and, you know, de- and desert, desert. Yeah. you know, which, uh, and which has different, you know, has more imp- different implications. I mean, jungle type warfare that you encountered in Vietnam is very tactical. It's mm-hmm. very, very close. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, a hundred meters in a jungle is, a long, long way. Yeah. In a desert, 100 meters is nothing. Yeah, that's because it's so wide open spaces and everything like mm-hmm. that. But so what? What re- really took off, I think, in uh, in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, was the concept of combined arms. Mm. You know, using all, using everything, aviation, using artillery, using you know, direct fire weapons, missiles. You know, anti tank mm-hmm. guided missiles, those mm-hmm. kinds of things. And then you, and then the individual weapon system that each soldier, sailor, airman, or marine carries. Uh, and uh, that was that was something that kind of changed our perspective a little. Bit. I remember being very very good at the very t- tactical level uh, in the woods, mm-hmm. and then from and when that was as a platoon commander. And then when I after Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and I'm a company commander, uh, it, it was much more focused on combined arms. And, okay. And, and putting your enemy in a dilemma where if they get up, they're dead. If they stay down, they're dead. If they move to the left, they're dead. If they move to the right, they're dead. Mm. No matter what they do, you put something on them that's going to put them on the horns of a dilemma, as we would put it. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. So with that training evolution that you saw over those years, now that we've entered, again, going from a peacetime into yeah. war and, and basically perpetual conflict until yeah. just a couple of years ago, now that we're out of a, a, a wartime situation from your geo position, would you see that uh, the training is more proactive uh, in being prepared for you know, multiple different types of fights, or do we just posture ourselves into a more reactive situation and wait for something well, to happen? I'm, I'm afraid that um, I'm afraid that we're gonna you know as try try as we might mm-hmm. to anticipate what's next sure. and be ready for it. Uh, we're, we have a history of not being right. Yeah, uh, where that's concerned. Uh, number one, number two. Um, the defense budget is looks good. I mean, and I'm, and I'm supposed to not get po- political here. Oh no, 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 just dive in. I, I, yeah, dive in. we just don't want to hear opinions. We want to hear it's facts. Not, it's not opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, 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 the DoD budget is looks okay. Mm-hmm. Looks pretty good. Yeah, but a lot of that's not going to uh, to the, the fielded forces. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're having to pay tax to to, to support things like uh, the Ukrainian, for example, the Ukrainian ar- uh, military. Mm-hmm. That's that's not those aren't materials coming to us. Sure. Those are materials going to somebody else. Yes. And there's 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 uh, similar situations in the Pacific. I mean, there's some c- concern there. Worried about the Pacific too. Yeah. You know, and uh, and so uh, my my sense is that um, we're in a in a. It, it, it looks a lot, uh, very much the same as a inter, you know interwar slash peacetime okay. military, where 
where we're uh, having to be more innovative mm-hmm. and yeah. creative and resourceful uh, to be able to maintain ma- maintain our, our edge of proficiency. It's sure. difficult. And it changes every single yeah. day, as yeah. you were saying. So yeah. everything's just a dynamically evolving yeah. situation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, with these apps that are going on, like yeah. how do you yeah. control that data flow? Like, yeah, you know, it's it's a it is a blessing and a curse hmm. to have all that capability is a blessing, but to have all that capability it may, it presents vulnerabilities mm-hmm. that that can be very concerning. And uh, you know, and we're um, we are not the monolithic uh, power in the world anymore. Mm-hmm. I think I, I I don't think that that's not my opinion. I, I think that's that's just I mean that's just the way it is. I think I think in space. I think on and down in in the in the the air and in mm-hmm. the, on the land and in the maybe in the sea maybe too. But uh, I think in, we're being challenged in all those domains. Yes, mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, in ways that we never have been before. Yeah. And, and so, uh, what do you do? I mean, and. and and, and the, you know, we, we have the, the saying about the, using your, your instruments of national power. Mm-hmm. Uh, you use diplomacy, it's dime, the dime yeah. thing, diplomacy, information, military, and economic. Yeah. And when you look at those instruments of national power, uh, we're, it doesn't appear that we're as, carrying as much weight in those areas mm-hmm. as maybe we once have. Mm-hmm. As, as, uh, I, th- I think that that... I think that's a fair statement. Yeah, I, mean, I do I too. Think, yeah, you know, diplomatically, you know, I think we're not being as effective. I mean, there's people lining, there's countries lining up against us. They're they're forming coalitions, mm-hmm. kind of against us. That's not a good sign from a diplomatic standpoint. Yeah, yeah. Mul- mm-hmm. I mean, multiple people yeah. at this point. Yeah, yes. Saudi Arabia, for instance. Yes, yeah. Iran, Iran. Iran. You know all that. Yeah, that's that's not that's not good news. Uh, mm-hmm. And and so yeah. because and and I think that it has large in part due to the fact that um, we are at this conflict across the board here. Yeah. So people, when they smell weakness a little bit, they kind of jump on it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that, well, I think whenever we have projected weakness, we have come, we've come to regret it and we've had to take corrective action to mm-hmm. overcome it. Uh, it. It's kind of a sine wave. It ebbs yeah. and flows. It, you know, we're, uh, we're, you know, hey, we're going to be peace dividends, you know, all this other kind of stuff. We're going to focus on domestic policies. Mm-hmm. You can't, you, the, the number, in, in my, in, my, in my mind, the number one function of our government is to ensure our national security. That mm-hmm. means a lot. Yeah. That, that There's more to it than, than just having a military. Mm-hmm. It's economic national security. Mm-hmm. It's diplomatic national security. It's, it's leveraging all of our instruments of national mm-hmm. power and enhancing those to make sure that we're, uh, we're providing for our national security. Yes. In yeah. the Constitution, provide for, you know, our common defense. And, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. and, and it's, but, it's, but it's not just a military thing. It's, a, it's an economic thing. It's an... It's in, in, in that, and it's a, to ensure that you have to use diplomacy and information to, to be able to uh, make sure we can at least influence the narrative, if mm-hmm. nothing else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you would agree that there's just so much going on that the average person doesn't realize and they just complain. You know, there's so much complaints yeah. about what's going on. You know, why are we spending money overseas when we're not spending money here to take care of our own people? Yeah. And and is that is that because there's a, a vast misunderstanding of well, what we're facing? I think in some cases that's true, but I think in some cases your average Joe six the you know six pack uh, has a pretty good idea of what's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, you know I I don't think we should sell them short. Uh, you know I think they have a pretty good idea of what's going on, and, and if they if it. You know, if it you know if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, swims like a duck, it's probably a duck kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, sure. You know, <laughs> it, it if it smells bad, if it doesn't look like it's the right thing, it probably is not the right thing. Mm-hmm. And, and and there's some of that going on, I think, uh, you know, where, where we're investing in things that would be better spent on on, on other uh, efforts, like efforts here at home. Sure. Uh, mm-hmm. But. Um, and efforts on our own military, for the, for example, I mean, yeah. focus on focus on our military, and uh, instead of instead of and trying to enhance other people's military. To true story, yeah, an just, interesting conversation we had last week was there is so much money being put into development of new technology that we're kind of faltering on taking care of what we currently have and the mm-hmm. current troops yeah. that are out there. Their equipment's kind of getting. You know, it's not being maintained properly, yeah. but we're yeah. spending all this money on the F-35, you yeah. know, and the development of these new technologies. Yeah, yeah. and so th- having said that, I mean, 
the the F-35 and the F-22, that they provide a capability. Almost all of it is ca- classified at the SAP level with special special a- access program, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is higher than top secret SCI. Yeah, uh, it's pretty. F- the, the capability is 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 pretty eye watering. Yeah, uh, pretty astounding. And, and that's about all I can say about that. Uh, about the, about <laughs> I tried to dig yeah. a little yeah. bit, but <laughs> <laughs> no dice. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but uh, but um, so some of that's really important. But um, but but again, it has to be. You gotta, and then we have to. We well, there's things we have to do too. Mm-hmm. For example, we have to for, for cyber. Cyber has become a a, a, a big concern. Yeah. So uh, we're gonna have to. Uh, Come up with whole cyber uh, service components, mm-hmm. you know, and so that costs not only money; it costs structure, yes. people, yeah. and, and we didn't get plussed up for that. Mm-hmm. You just so had to divide. We had to, we had to yeah. reorganize in, in the Marine Corps case, and I, I'm sure it's the other services too. Mm-hmm. It just feels different in the Marine Corps because we're small to begin with, and we're having to carve out structure to build, to come up with a whole new commands. So we have Mar 4 Cyber. I mean, yeah. we didn't have that before. Well, that's good to to go back to your your comment and and the discussion on Joint Task Force yeah. and those establishing yeah. in in the early '90s. It's the same situation that we can start to apply and start to utilize uh, our sister services as well, right? That's what the entire reason for the Space Force standing up was yeah. to alleviate the Air Force's stress with yeah. not being able to have a command you know, person in command. Uh, who is not a rated pilot be in charge of satellites or be yeah. in charge of cyber because it, it creates more conflict. Well, they saw that they saw the need. There's yeah, a, there's a need for a space necessary. force. Because, yeah. And the thing that highlighted that was, I think we're being handed our lunch in Ex- space. Exactly. Again, yeah. uh, that's about all I can say about that. Sure, but but, but uh, it's true. Fair, fair to say that we're we're not dominating space like we once did. Mm. And 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 if you if we don't invest in it. Then we're going to get further. We're going to get behind and yeah. further behind, and then and then can you imagine when, if if everything in space is controlled by somebody other than us, and, yeah. and uh, you know, and and our interests aren't represented up there mm-hmm. or defend, able to be defended up there, yeah. that would be uh, that would be a problem, detrimental. And yeah. so we we need to have we need to have a space force. And there's yeah. still a Agreed. huge misunderstanding of what the space force is. Yeah. yeah. Well, with with the Air Force used to be in charge of space and cyber primarily, but to be a commander in one of those units, you had to be a rated pilot. Mm. So you had pilots in charge of satellites, you had pilots in, start of, in charge of cyber, which didn't necessarily make sense because yeah. they don't have the experience there. Yeah, we're see, seeing less of that now than what yeah. we did in the uh, back, because you know, I remember my dad would told me, well, mm. when, I, when I was thinking about going in the military, he, he asked me, well, where are you, you going to go in? Yeah. I said, well, I, was, so I guess maybe the Air Force, that's kind of what our family does. He goes, he goes well, what are you going to do? And I go, well, I, I, I don't know. I just don't want to fly. He goes, well, don't go in the Air Force. <laughs> yeah, go somewhere else. Yeah, because yeah. if, you, you know, if you're not going to fly, don't go in the Air Force. Yeah. That was kind of how it was. That was the mindset back then. Less so today. Sure. There, there are people who have, uh, that are in command of Air Force units, mm. Space Force units that are not rated pilots. Yes. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's no guarantee. And, and so to your point about the F-35 and the F-22, there are those that are th- saying at some point, you know, th- those, those air, those, you know, fifth generation aircraft are limited by the human being yeah. in some respects mm, that yes. pilots them. Yeah, I mean, in terms of you know the, their duration that they can fly. Yeah, uh, and in terms of their G tolerance mm-hmm. and all those kind of the, the you know the air physiology kind of aspect to all of that, uh, it, it's uh, they're limited by the human being yeah. in in many respects. Now they're enhanced by the human being on the other hand in, in some respects too. So, but but I think I think everyone probably could see the potential of of uh, aircraft uh, being unmanned yeah. completely mm. yeah no no g limit at I that mean, point no g yeah. limit uh, well, I mean, you can you can stress just the aircraft. hours and hours as opposed to yeah, flight. you probably have the yeah. same site picture uh, yeah. from some, somewhere else if from, not better <laughs> if not better <laughs> yeah. from a ground station someplace yeah. else flying the mission yeah. and uh, you know and it would it, it would certainly uh, make make evolving the aircraft easier without the limitations of a human well, being. That, that thing is a mm. sheer spacecraft. I mean, that, that is yeah. an alien spacecraft. The technology <laughs> that these pilots have now, just where yeah. they are, have full, you know, visuals where they could see under the plane. Yeah. They could look and see. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's... It's incredible. It's incredible. So this begs the question that we're faced all the time is if we were to get into another conflict, you know, and... It, God willing, it's never going to happen. But World War Three, for instance, 
it, are we going to fight the same war as we've seen in the past? We mm. never fight the same war we've right? seen in the past. Man. Boots on we, the ground always, is not... Well, I don't, you know, and we always say that boots on the ground is going to be something that that's antiquated way of even of thinking about it. But you mm. know what? Yeah. My, my, my 36 plus years uh, and my, and my uh, years before that as a young man growing up in a military family... And everything that I've studied and everything in you know, looking at history and looking at things from a futuristic standpoint, too, you're reading sci-fi novels that are way out there and everything. Uh, my sense is that there will always be a requirement for boots on the ground mm-hmm. in some capacity. It's yeah. just how that looks. It's going to may, maybe change a little bit. And, uh, you know, if you read Robert Heinlein, for example, I mean, yeah, there that's a little that's kind of fantastic but still there there may be some there may be something there in the you know but uh so i i don't think we can discount i think i think we're it's always uh when you start looking at trying to gain efficiencies by cutting uh, boots on the ground mm-hmm. uh, i think we have to be real careful there because i think it sometimes there's some things some situations where you just have to have that presence yeah physical mm-hmm. presence and, and does it need to be the same presence that we've had in the past Probably not, yeah. uh, but but it, but they need to have enhanced capabilities. Yeah, maybe could, less conventional, right? Less conventional, yeah. such and, as the sniper program, <laughs> well, right? The one that we just <laughs> the one is you just, just, just cut. Yeah, uh, yeah. How, do you, how, do you, how does that make you feel? I, for, it makes me feel horrible. I yeah. bet. I, I bet. I, 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 you know, so so they say. Well, we're moving into reconnaissance, uh. and well, they've already had snipers in reconnaissance, so it's a personal offset, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And and it, you're, yeah, again, it's it's a lot of pressure put on the on the Marine Corps and our our current current commandant. A lot of pressure on him to to do more with, or do at, at least as much with less, a lot less. And so the infantry battalion, for example, has got it, you know it used to be when you called an infantry battalion up and gave them a mission, you got a thousand, you know, especially if you're reinforced with you know combat engineers and yeah. you know and, and that kind of. Thing. When when I took when I took my battalion this when we were celebrating our 20th anniversary of going from Kuwait into Iraq first battalion to cross into Kuwait uh, from Kuwait into Iraq uh, when I did that I had 1,200 Marines sailors and uh, and we had a, some soldiers mm-hmm. uh, and uh, at 1,200 that's a big that's a big battalion yeah and most other places they call that a brigade mm-hmm. okay but it's yeah. but that, that's a Marine infantry battalion was you, you, when you when you call up a Marine Infantry Battalion, you got some freaking combat power that you just called up. Mm. And, and you know, there's that whole saying about, you know, that, the, you know, when, when I, yea, though I walk through the sha- valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, evil because I'm the biggest mf in the valley. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's kind of how you feel. Because yeah. you, know, you, got, you got a bunch of well-trained, a whole bunch of well-trained, well-armed, and, the, you know, uh, Marines and that are going to, they're, they're going to just... Uh, do do uh, you knock down every th- walls for you if you need to? Oh yeah. But do it in a thoughtful way. I mean, we last thing we wanted to do was make mo- make more enemies than we already had. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you know, we, we want to make sure we kind of we, we're committed to cutting down on collateral damage. But it's with the understanding that warfare is a is a messy business, and that's why I I really hesitate to fully endorse you know look, you know reducing or doing away with the boots on the ground requirement mm. because that you can be that's precise yeah yeah i mean yeah. Yeah, that's you and me when you have eyes on that's effective. right that's yeah. you and me you are you a good guy good good guy or a bad guy mm-hmm. and and that's that decision is being made you know mano a mano mm. eye to eyeball to eyeball mm-hmm. and uh and and whereas if it's done from from uh space or yeah. if it's done from a uh a drone someplace um I don't think you can make that same kind of call. And how, how does that work in a urban environment? I know mm-hmm. we have yeah. we have small drones that can go into, but it's just not the same. I, I I'm I'm going to have to be, you know, maybe old fashioned on that one. Just like with the iron sights, you got to have you got to have the basics. You got to have you got to be able to land now without a GPS, all that kind of stuff. You got to be able to to uh, defeat an enemy mm-hmm. in in the old fashioned way if you need to, and that's. And, and it might be that you have to be very precise in doing that, and, and that would necessitate ground troops. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in my um, mind, I, I agree with you completely. But uh, do you think it's going to be more specialized with like introducing uh, more soft integration or, or yeah. more soft forward instead of conventional warfare? Or I, I guess it, it really depends on what conflict we enter. <laughs> we well, enter next, I, right? Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. It, it does. But I, I see. Be and I'm seeing a movement now mm. where uh, what was once conventional. 
looks a lot more like Saf yeah. than it than it ever has before. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah As, and, I mean, even if it, Afghanistan. Yeah, Afghanistan started really transitioning mm-hmm. from that conventional way of looking at warfare to a more special operations yeah. driven. Yeah. yeah, and and there's there's history to that. You know, we all we have to do is look at the CAP program back in Vietnam that we, that we kind of bailed on. That's a combined action platoon program in mm-hmm. Vietnam that we kind of bailed on and we forgot about, but it was very successful. It was really special operations kind of oriented mm-hmm. where you're, you're living with and, and building relationships with and, and, and operating with uh, a locals. Mm, okay. And, 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 and that worked pretty, that worked pretty darn well. But, you know, again, it was, but it, it was, and then of course you had special forces that really, special forces really that uh, off, kind of. got, got started and really gained traction in Vietnam yeah. mm-hmm. and, uh, and, 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 and really are what they are today because of that beginning. So, um, yeah, I think, I think, I think there's going to be a movement towards all conventional forces being, forces being, having a more soft like capability. Mm. Now there's, going to be degrees of special operations forces yes you know, obviously the, the, yeah. the green berets you know they're, they're they have a role and it they are they are soft mm-hmm. period you know and they 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 they, 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 they wrote the book basically yeah and then that but then you have there, then there's gonna be very you know, let maybe lesser forms or are some that incorporate more conventional capability mm-hmm. but um but i think everybody's gonna look a little more soft like than they have in the past yeah mm-hmm. and w- with that d- would you anticipate a drawdown in manning requirements because more specialized career fields like that yeah. existing? I, again i hesitate on that because yeah. uh because of w- the doubt that we have about what our next conflict is going to sure. look like yeah, yeah. or when you know, and now now it could be that we time's not on, on our side anymore these you know it used to be that you know, we we would have the time to mobilize. Mm-hmm. We would have the time to build the Iron Mountain someplace, and yeah. we'd be able to find find another country that we can come into, that we can build this Iron Mountain, and then we can attack whatever you know whatever country it is from that from that from another yeah. country, mm-hmm. and and with that Iron Mountain and that kind of thing, meaning supplies and everything that you, everything we need to be able to you know to to fight the conflict. Yeah. Um, I just don't see us being able to do that to the, to the degree we have in the past. We're not going to get as much time. We're not leaders aren't going. To, I think there's been enough that have seen us operate that are going to say they're going to realize that we can't give them six months to get ready. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because they'll use that six months to our disadvantage. Yeah, and at the rate that we're able to travel across the world yeah. in mass now, yeah. and the way that information travels, yeah. we don't have the time to spin up. Like we don't we used have the to. time to spin yeah. up. So we're going to have to be more ready, mm. much quicker. And and so what does that mean relative to to our, you know, manning and to our, you know, to our structure yeah. and, 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 and to our task organization. How mm. do we task organize? What are we task organizing for? Mm. Mm. You know, and, and so we, ha- and, and it's going to have to be something that, it, that uh, can answer a lot of different uh, contingencies. Yeah. And, and, that Im- and that implies to me that you have a, somewhat of a deep bench, maybe not as deep as it's been in the past, but, but it, if, it, and if it's not as, as deep as it's been in the past, it's going to have each individual... Uh, is going to have to be more uh, have to be more capable. They're going to have to have uh, more uh, uh, more th- systems to leverage, okay. more technology to leverage, but with the understanding that they they can operate without it too. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, it's 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 a it's a difficult problem. Yeah. Very. And that's and when people come in, like like Dave said earlier, with with complaints about, well, why are decisions being made this way or that way? Well, just like you talked about, this this is a very touchy subject, yeah. and the, the the decisions that you make have very very large implications yeah. for not only individuals but national security. So yeah. understand that making these decisions can be very difficult. Yeah, and when you combine that with our acquisitions process, yeah. which is which is slow and unwieldy, and mm-hmm. there's a reason why it's slow. It's slow to make sure that it's uh, that that it uh, that it uh, doesn't get corrupted. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, and that it, it we we uh, that we acquire things. We we do all the necessary uh, capability uh, tests. You know, initial capabilities document, capability mm-hmm. development document, capability production document. Yeah, you, you have this acquisition process that 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 takes time. Yeah, guess what. Our 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 uh, potential adversary, our adversaries, or potential enemies, they don't have that. Yeah, they don't have those wickets that they have to go through. If they want something field, they feel they field it right and now. There is yeah, so much red done. tape. Yeah, here there is. that is happening. There is, and, and there's. Go ahead. And well, and when uh, and whenever we can't pass a budget, I'm going to get political here. Sorry. Uh, no, we, we want it. We want whenever it. Whenever we <laughs> can't real. pass a budget, 
we get a we get a continuing resolution authority. MCR, yeah. When you get a continuing resolution authority, you can't. There's no new no new starts. Yeah. You can start no new programs. Mm-hmm. That kills us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, in my mind, uh, that combined with the fact that in many cases, whenever we have a you know, we can't comp- uh, can't approve a budget, we furlough civilian um, mm-hmm. employees. Yeah. And and I I was in the Pentagon when that happened a couple times. Uh, that. That doesn't that they they go home and eventually they get they get paid back. Yeah. But we we didn't have them in the building uh, for uh, for the time that they were furloughed. Mm-hmm. And those civilians that are working in the DOD and the Pentagon, they have a, they have a purpose. They are the continuity. They are the mem- their corporate memory. Yeah. And and, and when when they're sent home. Uh, that's not a good thing. And when you can't start new programs, that's not a good thing. No. So in my mind, uh, you know, the, the job of Congress is to pass the budget. Mm-hmm. It should be a law that they pass the budget by the, by the beginning of the fiscal year or they don't go home. Yeah. That, you know what? They don't go I, home. And then, and then if, yeah. they go, if it goes beyond one November, they don't get paid until they do. Yeah. That's what I have been saying forever is yeah. let's put them in a room. The decisions Shove need to be... under the door. <laughs> yeah. you know, there you go. We'll keep you hydrated. Decisions yeah. need to be made so that we can make effective decisions yeah. and take care of the national security yeah. of this nation. Yeah, yeah. there's got to be some compromise. And, yeah. and, and the, right now, is there's, there's just no appetite for compromise. And so... So we don't get we don't get budgets approved, and, and it guess who suffers? Yeah. It kills us. Yes, exactly. And the we're getting suffer. farther and farther behind because they don't have to play by those rules. Yeah, yeah. And they don't have to worry about you know, the four year and eight year election well, cycle. And and look at the recruitment right yeah. now. Oh yeah. 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 Look Rock at the bottom. issues in recruitment. Yep. We can't even find. You know, Colorado is the the fittest city in America. They say, and they can't find a single recruit in the last seven months. Where in Colorado, like Denver. Specific? Just Colorado. Oh, okay. Right? Wow. Colorado Springs, specifically, where I'm talking to a recruit, yeah. recruitment branch out there. I, is a buddy I, I live right by, you know, I live right in, in Woodland Park. So it's I'm hard right to there. find recruits. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, and uh, I will tell you, I got, I actually got called down to, asked to go to um, the recruiting station, Marine Corps recruiting station in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Hmm. So I live in Woodland yeah. Park. It's not too far. You know, day, day, easy, day, easy day drive. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because they were not making mission. That's not that's not acceptable from the Marine Corps standpoint. We put mm. our, we put some of our best Marines out on recruiting duty, yeah. with the idea that you get what you give. Mm-hmm. You give if you put the best out there, then you're going to get good Marines, you know, coming yeah. in. And they were having a hard time making mission. So I went down there because. And what's happened is to, a couple of things. One, all the contacts that that they used to be able to leverage. Uh, had dis- dis- had disappeared because of COVID. Mm. Everybody, no one was going out or anything like. And there no was no, those contacts yeah. were being the meetings that were happening weren't happening any longer, and so they they didn't have those uh, those contacts anymore. And, and then on top of that, um, because st- high school students were were not going to school, yeah, they were they were doing virtual high school or whatever, and that did not work. Uh, we're having a hard time with with. Uh, with young potential recruits being able to pass the ASVAB. Yeah. I mean, that's mm. pass the ASVAB. Not not get a, a, a good score. Yeah. Just passing it. And the fitness. Yeah. Yeah. The fitness. Well, and the fitness, too. Yeah. But, uh, I know 60% right now is what they're saying of graduating seniors across, across the U.S. at a median. 60% are not eligible for the military from a physical standpoint. Well, that's just from a physical standpoint. Yeah. It's 75 or more overall. Mm-hmm. Are not eligible because you've got uh, they're, they're taking medications that they can't take. Mm. So let's put three yeah. out of four oh, individuals, yeah. every bit of it, if, are not eligible. That's right to yeah. enter the modern military. See what may have been youthful folly for us when we were growing up too is a felony conviction these days. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's true. So, yeah. so you know you get a felony conviction, a felony conviction, and and uh, you know I remember trying. You know, when I was the the, the CG of uh, Paris Island's uh, Marine Corps Recruit Depot and the CG of the Eastern Recruiting Region for Marines, which is all the recruiting of officer and enlisted hmm. east of the Mississippi River, uh, I will tell you that, uh, you know, it, it was we had some cases where there were felonies. But uh, when you looked at you looked really closely at the case, it was like, oh, somebody to- toilet papered somebody's house yeah. and then <laughs> and then they got on their porch. So that was breaking and entering. Man. Yeah. And that's a felony. And then there was yeah. another one where guys in West Virginia and he pulls up to his high school and he's a deer hunter and he forgot. He still had his rifle in the, in the sure. back of his yeah. in the back of his uh, rifle rack in his vehicle. That's a felony conviction right Man. there. So, you know, there's some, you know, 
some where we're, where, where we're our own worst enemy, but sure. then there's there's other cases where we have but we have to take a real hard look at every one of those mm-hmm. because yeah. if there's a reason you know we, for them not to come in, then then we have to make we have to you know take a hard look at that. And if they're you know, but we there's there's there are waivers. Yes, but um, as well there should be, and, and there always should be waivers. Yeah. Every you know because. That just means that you're giving due diligence to looking at each case individually mm-hmm. instead of just having a blanket. Uh, no, that's exactly it. Every everybody has yeah. an individual case, yeah. Yeah. An individual yeah. story. So we've talked a lot about the capabilities, past, present, and future of our military. I want to dig in because I know you're a little short on time here um, to kind of post service and what that looks like too. There are so much issues with what's going on today. Some of our veterans are you know, first and foremost, mental health, all yeah. of these these issues that they're facing and the conflicts between the parties, which being detrimental to them and yeah. their health as well. Uh, for instance, the Congressional Budget Office com- com- yeah. coming out with a suggestion to cut, you know, veteran uh, benefits if they're 100% dis- yeah. disabled. So what is your stance on kind of um, that post-service for veterans and, and where we're kind of pushing... Uh, forward with that mental yeah. health. Uh, I don't think this is going to surprise you, but um, you know, I will tell you that um, we spend a lot of money on a lot of things, and and there are a lot of things that we we spend money on as a nation that would probably be, be best spent on something else. Mm. This is not one of those areas. Mm. I mean, these are young men and women who have put their life on the line, yeah, and 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 forfeited their health, forfeited their well being. Mm. Uh, and 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 done that willingly, to to serve their nation and to serve their fellow soldier, sailor, airman, marine on their left and on their right. They deserve the best that we can give them, the best that we can give them. Uh, and to think that we're gonna you know, we're fund things like reparations for you know stuff, and we're, we're thinking about funding free education and free uh, free housing and free everything for people coming across coming into our country illegally in mm. some cases mm. uh, you know I'm not saying that those aren't that those, those aren't problems that need to be addressed but but uh, not not until we've paid this this bill that mm. that is owed mm. by our nation it's owed by our nation to these young men and women who've gone off in harm's way and have come back and and have, and have uh, and, and are having difficulties, whether it's physical, whether it's you know post-traumatic stress disorder, whether mm-hmm. it's tra- traumatic brain injury, yeah. mm-hmm. whether it's visible wounds or whether they're not you know, vis- wounds that you can't see, but they're on the inside. We've got to take care. We have a moral obligation to do that. Uh, so that's money. That's in my mind is money well spent. Yes. That is that is that is not uh, that is not disposable income for our nation. That's mm-hmm. a bill that is in, that has been written in blood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we need to make sure we t- we treat it that way. Yeah, and, and we're seeing that uh, uh, these nonprofit organizations really bridging that gap yeah. between what you know our, our government yeah. is just not doing at this. Well, point. and you know, God bless them. I mean, you, you know, you're, you're wearing a shirt, Robert Irvine Foundation, right there. I mean, that. Yeah. And uh, I, I can tell you that uh, what it's 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 wonderful what that foundation and and foundations like it do. Uh, it's a little bit unfortunate that it's necessary for them to have to do what to do what they do to the degree they're doing it because mm-hmm. because there is a gap yeah yeah uh, that shouldn't be why they're doing it because there's a gap there should be it should be because hey they just want to just want to just like going back from the basics yeah that's you exactly know, right it should it should bolster you up right it should, exactly it should right. be that yeah. you know eotech on your rifle yeah. in support of those iron sights yeah. it's it's basic you know taking care of them it's a promise that we make you know, it, we take, we're going to take care of you, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, and, uh, to make for, for Congress to any, somebody in Congress to suggest, uh, cutting that or doing away with this or whatever it, you know, whatever, uh, they, they're looking for in terms of fi- fiscal offsets to, uh, to, you know, to fund something else. Um, they, they need, they need to, they need to look somewhere else mm-hmm. yeah. because, because this is, that, that is, that is not a, disposable income bill and that that showcases just the strength of the veteran community as well it is <laughs> no nope, we're a community we're going to say yeah. no to this and uh, interestingly enough on on a kind of a, a better subject of why we're here today why yeah. we get to interview yeah. you is because we're at reunite the brave yeah. with your unit yeah um 
and these guys are still just equally as as fearful, you know, or yeah. as as you know, you would fear these guys. <laughs> I tell you, still it, Marines, yeah, you know. I, I would, I would, I would. I'm sure there are other units that are like it. Yeah, but uh, but uh, this one was mine. Yeah, let's talk about this it was my bit. this was my unit, and uh, you know, and I was God, I was so proud to be associated with them. I yeah. mean, because they they, are, they walked the walk and they talked the talk. Mm. Mm. They, under the most difficult circumstances, they they performed what they were their mission as they were trained to do. They did it masterfully, and they did it without uh, without making new enemies. Mm. You know, uh, it, it, they, and uh, being being smart and being compassionate, fighting with compassion. But it, you know, and it, but if, and if anybody engaged us, though, uh, boy, they could put a world of hurt down in a second, mm. and they did. And uh, and, and so. Um, I don't think I've ever been more proud of to be associated with. I have never been more proud to be associated with a unit than that unit by by, by far. No, and what, I've been what a unit. What's that? What unit? Can you? Let it was First Battalion's Fifth Marines. One five. Uh, yeah, one five from from, from First Marine Division. Mm-hmm. And you were the commanding officer for how long of this? Uh, Your career well, it was from. Well, let's see. Oh, gee, that was two thousand and one to two thousand and three. So yeah, you were yeah, after we got back. Yeah. So the summer after we got back from. From Iraq, yeah. I, uh, I, I PCS'd, but, uh, so I was there for two years, which is a tr- typical command tour. I took mm-hmm. command in, uh, in August of 2001, wow. and in September 11th of 2001, less than a month, less than a month of taking command. I mean, I, I, I took command, and I was like, okay, here's my wow. training, training, education, and employment plan for the next two years, you know, yeah. and, and, and looking at all the major tra- exercises and deployments and all that we were going to be doing with a great deal of excitement and anticipation, you know, and then less than a month later, that all was, that all changed. All changed. All changed. And, Incredible. And, and uh, we, we knew, we knew, and I, I, at every formation that we had, I t- had opportunity, I had to talk to the Marines and sailors of the battalion. I told them, hey, when we're, when we're training, we need to make sure we're training like it's for real because it's going to be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and so get ready because you're going to go to combat with that Marine on your left and that Marine on your right. And, I mean... Just internally, how did that make you feel? Um, how did it make me feel personally? Yeah, like I mean, September 11th happened. You're, I mean, this is a huge wrench yeah. that is just thrown in yeah. to everybody's lives. Yeah, I, I didn't really regard it as so much a, a wrench as I just I felt the weight of responsibility on me yeah. like I've never mm-hmm. felt before I can because imagine. I knew we were going to go to combat and I knew that and, and I am I did not want to lose one. Marine or sailor or soldier, anybody that was signed up, I didn't want to lose one. Yeah, of course. You I know, can't imagine uh, that and, responsibility. And, uh, and, and so everything that we did was to try to train them to be as proficient as they could be and, as, and, and, as, and to give them every opportunity to, to fight and, and come back home. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I was very hopeful that that would happen. It didn't, but... Um, yeah, and the, and the, the interesting, you know, that's the interesting thing. The the ironic thing is that the the Marines that we lost were the very best we had, mm-hmm. the very best we had. Yeah, I mean, you know, and that, that's you know, so it's it does you know they were they were and they were ex- extremely well trained. Yeah, but uh, we we don't control everything. You can't. You can't, you can't control everything. It, I mean, it, it is millimeters and inches, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. and it's, I think about them every day. I mean, I can't, I can't, yeah, it's, the, it's, I think about them every day and it, it's sort of, it, sometimes, some people would think that's unhealthy, but at the same time, it makes me, uh, remember them. And that's mm-hmm. what this weekend is about, this reunion is about, it's about remembering those that we, we, that we left behind, yeah. those that didn't make it, those that made the ultimate sacrifice. And, and we have to talk about them. We have to tell their story because if, as long as we do, they're never really gone. Mm-hmm. They're yeah. still alive in us. You know, and yeah. and so we have uh, a lot of the Gold Star families are here mm. uh, with us to to celebrate this reunion, and and we want them to be with us because we want them to, we want them to remember and we want them to know that we remember mm. uh, their Marine, mm. uh, and uh, that that's no longer with us, and yeah. and th- we want them to know that they live on through us if no if nowhere else. Yeah. That's incredible. I, I can tell that that this definitely still affects you. Oh yeah. When, yeah. when, when you stop to consider you don't, and, and you think don't, back. You don't uh you you don't uh go through that. 
and and have that relationship yeah, and course. that responsibility and and then have things happen like that and then just be able to flush it away yeah you know you can't you can't i compartmentalized it sure for a while Mm -hmm. you know especially while we were still there put locked it away put it but sooner or later you gotta you gotta open that up and you gotta let it out yeah and uh, otherwise it'll it'll eat you alive and that is what this weekend is all about is being able to get back together and just express express it all we we Mm -hmm. have a a saying on the show too is is being tough but tender you know it's okay to be a marine yeah and you know let let your guard down a little bit uh when it's the right time right Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right environment. And uh, this is a safe, safe place to to share. And we we appreciate you for opening up. Um, And we're going to talk on our next episode with your sergeant major, one five sergeant major, um, a little bit more about this show or this uh, reunite the brave. Awesome. So thanks so much for being a guest today. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Interesting conversation. I wish that we could talk for another couple hours. (laughs) Yeah, but we well, gotta get you dressed and ready. Yeah, I do. I gotta get pretty. <laughs> yeah, gotta get you ready for tonight. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us All today, Fred. Thank you. Thank you very much. Real pleasure. This has been the Medivac Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if you uh, enjoyed today's episode, you can find more at medevacpodcast.com or at our Instagram at Medivac Podcast. Uh, drop us a DM, leave some love there, and uh, we'll see you next time. See you guys.